So I want to introduce, um, I was given a piece of paper that had an introduction from Mark on it, but I lost it. It fell out of my pocket somewhere, but I know what it said. It said something about being an ordinary man in extraordinary times and uh, being a voice for the voiceless, um, helping to protect the wolves that are coming out of Yellowstone from being hunted by special interest groups. Um, there's nothing ordinary about this man. He is um, an extraordinary human being. He fights every single day with people that are not nice. And he's always there at every single meeting. I was in Montana last year. He had no idea who I was. We went off into the backwoods. We're asking trappers some questions. Didn't do a whole lot of bad stuff to them, just interviewed them. And I got my life threatened a lot. Um, Mark stepped up and put me on his property so he couldn't get to me. Um, you know, at his own detriment because I left after a month and he has to live with these people. Um, he's an incredibly brave individual and I'm really proud to bring him up here today. Mark Cook from Wolves of the Rockies, thank you. I don't know if you ever heard of the Lamar Canyon Pack. They had a wolf called 06. And I happened to be in the valley taking pictures. And of course, I didn't have my camera at that time. But anyways, Lamar um, 06 was sitting on the hill with her uh, young pups. And the alpha male came off the hill, came down, went by a coyote den where there were some pups. And one of the coyotes came out and bit one of the young pups in the butt. And then it went, they went off their way to a bison kill. And when they got to the kill, they, of course they ate, they came back and then they fed the younger pups. 06 must have smelled the bite on one of the pups because she took that pup down the hill to the coyote den, pushed the parents away from the den, dug out the coyotes, killed the coyotes, and fed them to her pup. So it's kind of a graphic story, but I truly believe that wolves have a top-down trophic cascade effect on wildlife. This picture is, is kind of graphic. I think it takes me back to clan days. I find it very airy. I find it very disturbing. And I apologize for showing it to you, but I want you to see the mentality of some of the people we're up against. I would like this discussion to be two way. I want to hear what you have to say. What do you think of this photo? What's, what do you think is going on there? Anybody? Ignorance. Yeah. Sure. Terrible education. Sure. Fear. Fear. Hatred. Can you tell us, this is what I see going on. And this is, this is out of Wyoming. These are outfitters. I, I can't say that for sure, but based on my knowledge of the backcountry and where they're at, the ground is broken up. So I strongly suspect that this is an outfitting camp during the winter time. And these gentlemen, I'm being nice. These gentlemen here <laughs> believe that they're patriotic Americans. They got their flag up. They see the poor wolf that they killed. They see that as the federal government imposing their will from Washington on them. They didn't want wolves to begin with. So these cowards put on their clannish type hats or, or hoods to protect themselves because they don't want to be seen or known. And this photo is actually a slight representation of what we're up against in the region that I call home. I find it very, very hard to look at this photo because it kind of 
my parents when I was growing up <coughs> voted for George Wallace. <coughs> and I don't know if anybody is old enough. Well, some of us know who George Wallace was, right? I am the complete opposite. I'm glad that I don't, I don't see things that way. I embrace tolerance. So, that's what I deal with every day. And it's, it's scary sometimes. Go ahead, Not Sorry. Okay. Let me show you what's going on here. This is at the court. This was at a court case with a judge named Malloy, and it was when the wolves were being um, litigated in Montana. Was, I believe this was the first litigation. Outside the federal courthouse, you have your opposition to the wolves being reintroduced, not so much reintroduced, but what they're looking to do is take away the right of the federal government to impose or keep the protection of the Endangered Species Act. So all the ground that you see right there that these people are on, that's federal land because it's at a federal courthouse. Well, you have the right to come there and you know, uh, speak your mind, so to speak. These people, these people right here, are three Native Americans, and they are pro-wolf. They want to see wolves. Well, you can see the organizers who would be, and these are going to be common names, Rocky Mountain Health Foundation, Safari Club International, are the driving forces to do away with wolves. There's two things going on in Montana that are driving this. That is the hunting organizations and livestock. And I want you to know, I have malice towards the nun. I think there has to be a balance. I myself would consider myself a non-consumptive individual. I'm not opposed to hunting, but I am opposed to hunting wolves. I don't think you should be hunting predators. I am greatly opposed to trophy hunting. I think if you're going, there are areas in, in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming where people don't make a lot of money and they rely on the food that nature puts on their table. So it's hard to believe sometimes, but there are. So we need to have this tolerance for some of these people. But trophy hunting, I am adamantly opposed to. Mm -hmm. So these individuals show up at the courthouse trying to influence the judge in the outcome of, of a case that involves wolves. I want to tell you a story about a guy named Steve Strack. Steve Strack was the assistant attorney general for Idaho. Steve got up and told Judge Malloy, almost verbatim, you've heard this court case today. You've been told that Idaho cannot manage wolves. I'm here to tell you Idaho can manage wolves. And here's the key part. They will manage wolves at or nearly at the level they are now. That was an old face lie. And I, I talked to Steve and tried to get him to renounce that because Idaho has hammered wolves. They don't want wolves. Between Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho, you're talking about 320,000 square miles. It's a lot of land. There are probably 2,000 wolves in that area. I encourage you to help Emily because she is going to need your help. Wolves in this area are going to need your help. Management can't fall to the state. If it falls to the state, you're going to get the influence of the organizations that we oppose, Rocky Mountain Health, Sparry Club, have a huge impact. It's all about money, folks. So, here's the drivers. You got livestock, you got the hunting organizations, you have the state fish and wildlife departments. 
your representatives that most, for the most part, are consumptive people or, or trophy hunters, they're driving it. You have the extreme elements of society, that 20% that you're never gonna reach. They're always gonna hate wolves. There's nothing you can do about it. They're just gonna hate it. And then you have wildlife services. Wildlife service to a lesser degree. It sounds like a great organization. Does anybody know what wildlife services is? Okay, wildlife services is a department in the United States, it's an agency in the United States that's almost sole purpose is to kill wildlife. It used to be called animal control, I believe. But anyways, they protect airports, keep animals away from airports so airplanes don't, you know, are obstructed. But they also, when cattle are killed by wolves, or coyotes come in and kill cattle, or livestock, any type of livestock. Wildlife Service will come in and do an investigation, and if they determine that the animal was killed, or they have confirmed kill and they have probable kill, <coughs> if they determine one of those two things, they're gonna go after that pack. Sometimes some of the methods they use to go after packs is they have a Judas wolf. What they do is they'll capture a wolf that has come to eat on that cattle, put a collar on it, that will let that wolf go. And that wolf will go back to its den. That's naturally what it does. Then the trappers will go in there and either trap the wolves and kill them or shoot them and kill them. So wildlife service is changing. And I'm going to be honest with you. I have a good friend with the NRDC who is working closely with NR, uh, the NR, our wildlife services to bring about change. And that change is being driven by folks like you. They're hearing about it. So what you're seeing is a decrease in funding in wildlife service because people like us don't want them killing their wildlife. So in turn, they have to start embracing non-lethal methods, <coughs> flat rate, you know, alarm boxes, uh, radio collars, um, I'm going to talk about a gentleman in a few minutes who has done amazing things. Um, Seth Wilson is going to be here to speak. I encourage you to listen to Seth. He is probably the prominent individual in the world on how to live with, wild, you know, with wildlife, uh, bears, and wolves, especially in cattle country. So here are your tools for resistance. Folks, there's 15 million people in the United States that hunt, and it's declining. There's over 100 million people like us in the United States. Why are we having this trouble? Why isn't our voice being heard? And I'm asking, I don't know. I can't figure out why we are the majority. We get the minority. It's like the tail wagging the dog. I, I just can't figure it out. Research favors the wolves and the carnivores. We spend so much money, our community spends so much money on wildlife watching. Why aren't we being heard? I don't understand it. You need to start finding representatives that are wildlife friendly. That is critical. Those decision makers have to be there. Spend your income wisely. It sounds funny, but if you don't like, if you have a choice between a potato made in Idaho or a potato made in California, I don't want California. Every day you spend money, that's your way of voting and saying, you know what, I don't accept this. It's not the way it should be. Same with cattle. If you have a choice of buying Argentina beef or buying beef made in Montana, buy it from Argentina or somewhere else. It sends a voice that you're not going to accept what you see happening. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of litigation. I'm going to tell you why. Litigation has blowback. And they take it out, not on you and I, they take it out on the animals. Yeah, coaching is alive and well in Montana. 
I know for a fact that they poached Yellowstone wolves. I know for a fact that they poached wolves that literally five miles behind my house, National Forest. The longer an animal disperses, the greater the chance that that animal is going to die. I'll give you an example. The animal died behind my house. I think it was OR-17. They made it all the way from Oregon, across the uh, Snake River. Made it through the mine fields of Idaho. Went to behind my behind my property many, many miles, a place they call the big old battlefield. So it made it through the Dillon country, which is notorious for killing uh, wolves. Came over to Bitterroot Mountains and literally five miles behind my house was shot. And the only reason we know that is because she had a satellite collar. It goes into a mortality mode. Fish Wildlife Department comes out and discovers that. We put up a $2,000 reward, hoping to get somebody to speak up. And nobody did. So poaching is alive and well. An animal doesn't have a collar, odds are we're not going to know about it. That's, that's just how it works, sadly. OK, I'm going to explain to you what I see as the problem. Fish Wildlife and Parks has an annual budget in Montana of around $80 million. It gets no money from the general fund. Very, very little money from the general fund. All of its money comes from hunters, trappers, and fishermen. And I'm not against hunting and fishing. I dislike trapping. I, I will never like trapping. But I'm against them. So, as an organization that you're receiving the money from, who are you going to cater to? You're going to cater to that organization that is giving you the money. So the Good Old Boy Network is well in place. You have Pittman Robertson, which is funding, and Dingle Johnson, which is federal. When, when you go out and buy a firearm, you go out and buy a pistol or, or ammunition, there's a tax on that, a self-tax that eventually is split up and sent out to all the fish and wildlife departments in the United States. But that funding that you receive on behalf of these two programs has to be matching. So in other words, if the department doesn't have the money, they don't get as much money from PNR or DNJ. DNJ is more for fishing. There are some good things going on. There's a blue ribbon panel discussion going on now. I, I don't know the current status of it because of the current administration. He doesn't seem very pro-wildlife. So, you have these sportsmen who are claiming that they give all the money to the department so they should get representation according to the money that they give. This creates a problem because under the public trust doctrine in Montana, wildlife belong to all the people. And it's the responsibility of the governor to see to it that all interests are heard. They push this responsibility on a five-person commission that is appointed by the governor and the director of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, who I will have you know there's change coming because she's a lady this year. She was appointed, uh, Martha Williams was appointed and confirmed by the Senate, 47 to three. That's huge. So change is coming, but it's just not as fast as we would like. So my point, my point is this. If you're not happy with the way this is working, we need to bring about that change. And I think the Blue Ribbon Panel is a good way to start. We are going to tax ourselves. When you go out and buy binoculars for bird watching, you go out and buy telescopes for whatever it is you want to do, cameras, things like that, <coughs> there is a tax that's going to be placed on that. And that tax is going to be sent to the departments that manage fish and wildlife. That gives us a crack in the door. That once Money to a department is like a drug. Once they get hooked to it, they don't want to give it up. And by not giving it up, it gives us influence on how we want to see our wildlife managed. 
Okay. So what I'm telling you is there's little incentive for the departments to change as long as they're paying their bills. Well, lo and behold, there's not a, there's only probably out of the 50 states, there's probably only two or three states that are paying their bills and meeting their responsibilities to manage fish and wildlife. Montana is the one. So currently there's a thing called finding common ground and we're involved with it and what it was is the department is looking for other ways to bring in money. They want our money. But they want our money with no representation. So you're getting taxation without representation. It just doesn't work. So here's the, here's the dilemma I'm in right now. I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is great. We're on this organization. We can bring about change. We can have influence on the department. But the way the department's seeing this, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks are saying to themselves, okay, we, we get the non-consumptive consumptive community involved. We get their money, but we don't want to, we don't want to hear what they have to say. So there's a part of me that wants to proceed and see this blue ribbon panel and money trickle down to the departments and help the departments manage wildlife. But there's also a part of me that says, you know what, let it fail. And when they're absolutely desperate for money, we revive it. Because that money from the Blue Ribbon Panel is going to go somewhere. And if the department doesn't have matching funds, they're not going to get it. So at what point, there's leverage there. At what point do you say, just walk away from this and let it fail? What is in the best long-term interest of wildlife? <clears throat> Any thoughts on that? Sure. The gun control. Sure. Well, never going to have that If they control all that, there'll be less money coming in, but they're never going to get support. In what respect? Well, I mean, the gun lobby is so strong in this country. Sure. And that, you were saying some of the funding from that, there's a tax on all that kind of stuff. That's, that's already in place with Pittman Robertson. Yeah, so that's, that's just going to keep happening because they're not going to tackle the gun control. Absolutely. So I think um, that the first question that I have is regarding the hunting licenses. Is there a limit? Uh, is there an annual limit per year that the state sets out hunting license? No. No? no. Based on what do they create a budget and uh, the quantity of licenses that they give out to people? There, there are very few, unless it's like big orange sheep, mountain goats, you can buy as many licenses as you want. Because we thought about that originally. We thought, you know, okay, they're going to put out li licenses for wolves. If they only print off uh, 2,000 licenses, you know what, they will buy them all. Yeah. Okay, no, that's not how it works. They're, they're, they've been down that road, they've learned. If you want to buy 2,000 licenses, that's great. We'll print 10,000. So we tried to get around it from that angle, but it's just, you know, it's great thinking, but they're, they're well entrenched and they're well schooled on past things. So if you want to buy an out permit, you can buy you know, as many out permits you want, dare permits, as many as you want. They're happy to get that money. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of, up in the air on how we want to go with this. If they saw, though, that more people were buying licenses and stating, I'm buying this license in order to save the animal, sure. and if those numbers grew larger than the hunters, absolutely. That's, wouldn't, wouldn't that's, that? that's where we're trying to go. Okay, with this finding common ground, let me, let me tell you what happened. I'll back up a little bit. About two or three years ago, I was at a wolf, wolf herring in Rocky Mountain, they elk came in, and the guy's name was Blake Henning. And um, he came in and he said, you know what? We want the, we want the non-consumptive community involved. We're, we're tired of paying the bill for fish, wildlife, and parks. Let's, let's do this. And I'll never forget, he gave me this look like, screw you. Well, we got together. We organized the local uh, you know, NPOs. Um, we got together, 
We organized, we worked with the department, and lo and behold, we pulled together Defenders of Wildlife, both the Rockies, NRDC, uh, Greater Yellowstone. We pulled together all these uh, conservation organizations, and we, we got this thing up and running, and it became the wolf stamp. We were gonna have a wolf stamp. You were gonna be able to buy a wolf stamp for $20, you get a decal, and, and the, it, the money that you donated was going to go towards managing wolves in Montana non lethally. It was going to help get more wardens, it was going to help with education, and it was just going to help wolves in general, the management of wolves. Once we started picking up momentum and moving forward, this is the funniest thing. Those same people that said, you know what, the heck with you, you know, we're tired of paying this bill. They put the brakes on. Whoa, 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 we're going too fast now. Now you're saying you want to give money, but hey, I've been paying the bill for the last 100 years. We need to slow down on this. We don't know if we want your money. And they have such an influence over the department because this is why it failed. Because it was called a wolf stamp, they didn't want a single species license to help wolves. And they put the kibosh on it and killed it. Then finding common ground came to be. And that started moving forward. We put, we put a year of effort into that. And then we've come to the next legislative cycle, and it's kind of stalled. We've had to, the fortunate thing is we've had a change in leadership within the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. We now have a lady, Martha Williams, running the show, where before we had a good old boy, um, nice guy, Jeff Hagner, was running the show, but he has since retired, and we have new blood, and I, I'm very encouraged with Martha, what I've seen so far. So, what I'm telling you is, if you don't like the way it is, you gotta bring about that change. You can't just hope other people are gonna do it, because it's not gonna happen. It's going to stay status quo, and that's unacceptable. This gentleman right here, this is Jim Stone. Jim has a PhD. He's a postal digger. He owns a ranch literally across from the Bob Marshall Wilderness. It's about a million and a half acres of land, somewhere around there. Um, Jim is a, is a livestock producer. The Blackfoot Challenge is a group of livestock producers in the Blackfoot Valley. Many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of livestock producing. Literally across the street, maybe as a, as a crow flies, maybe a mile from the Bob Marshall Wilderness, where there's tons of wolves, grizzly bears, cougars, all these predators. They have developed a system to live with these animals. Give me an example. Say, um, say a pack of wolves come on Jim's property. They test. Jim figures out the wolves are moving from north to east. He sends out a test. The test goes to everybody in the Blackfoot Challenge in that area. It says uh, Jim's neighbors get this test. Well, you know what? Animals are coming out to my. They're moving to Jim's property. They're coming to my property. So my point is, Jim is doing the right things. He's trying to live with, uh, with these predators. And I mean, he is living with predators. Seth Wilson, one of the reasons Seth is so good at what he does, is he's part of this, this Blackfoot Challenge. He has set up uh, carcass removal programs to get the animals, the dead animals out of there and decompose somewhere else, so it's not, a, it's not pulling the animals, the predators into certain areas, well, they'll kill other animals, other uh, cattle. Jim Stone has the right attitude. He says that, I'll give you an example. About five years ago, six years ago, some of his neighbors that don't like the Blackfoot Challenge killed the bull, and they hung him from a street sign. Jim immediately knew, when he got together with all his buds, all his other livestock producers, that they're just taunting the non-consumption community, the conservation community. Jim gets it. 
I encourage you to sit in on Seth's talk because he'll explain in detail what they've done to live with these critters. And I want to say the kill rate for losing wolves has dropped drastically under his program. I would probably say in the last couple of years they maybe killed four or five wolves. And I, I know nobody wants to see wolves killed. I don't. But when you consider the hundreds of wolves that live there, and the grizzly bears that lives there, they're onto something. So why can't we take their program and put it in other places? And that's what we're kind of doing in Montana. We're trying to raise funding for the Livestock Boss Board. And what they're doing is, is setting up laundry programs, uh, carcass removal programs, and decom decomposition programs to help the livestock producers get their animals out of there that are dead and move them other places. And it, it discourages other wildlife coming in. So if you look at the top right of this program, this picture, that's the official kill. That's what's going on in Montana right now. Uh, it's actually, it's over now. It closed, uh, I think, March 15th. But these areas right here, one is trapping. And I want to say 80 or 90 wolves were killed because of trapping. And the other, uh, I want to say about 180 or so, or 160, were killed uh, because of hunting. This is how they keep track of it. If you look here, does anybody know what chinococcus granulosis is? It took me a long time to learn to say that. Um, there's going to come a point, and I, I'm sure it'll probably happen down here too. Um, it's a worm, and it gets into ungulates, tear, elk, moose. And the cycle goes like this. The wolves pick up the parasite. It spreads to their droppings when they scat. It's into the earth. The elk come along, they eat the grass. They pick up that. And they get little blebs in their organs, mostly their lungs. But this can also come, can be transferred to human beings if you handle, you know, scat. Um, you can get it from your dogs if they're rolling in the grass, those type of things. The odds of you getting it are one in a trillion. But my point is, the anti-wolf community will use that to their advantage. Oh my God, you're gonna get this. Wolves bring this nasty disease. The disease has been here for thousands of years. It's like in a firehouse yelling no fire. They're trying to create a response that drives down the support for wolves, especially in Montana. We have luckily got through all that. Val Geist, who is a gentleman who was a pro-wolf guy for a long time, and I understand his wife's dog was killed by a wolf, and he became anti-wolf. The Department of Environmental Quality held a hearing on this because, once again, the livestock and the hunting community has so much power that they told their legislators, we want a hearing on this. So we had a hearing on this, and Val Geis literally said, the only way you're gonna get rid of this, this parasite is to kill all dogs and then burn the earth. That's the only way, and that was his way of, of trying to bring about the change. It happens. This, this disease is out there like any other disease. I think that all the time that I've been, well, I'll tell you what, Doug Smith, who runs the Yellowstone program, told me he's handled a lot of food without gloves. You know, so if anybody was gonna have it, it'd be a person that handled a lot of it. So don't be alarmed at what they throw at you. The science firmly supports us. So this is how I saw the resistance that we face daily. You have a 20% factor in the community that hates wolves for whatever the reason, whether they kill cattle or that they kill elk because they're killing the elk that these people want to kill. Um, 
they become very vocal. The sportsmen and the livestock producers are the driving force behind this, and for obvious reasons. Does anybody know how many cattle there are in Montana? Just roughly? It's 2.5 million. Do you know how many wolves? Let me, let me back up. Do you know how many cattle were killed because of wolves last year in Montana? <coughs> 50. <laughs> okay. So, so, and here's the thing now. We have a program called the Livestock Loss Board who, if Wildlife Service comes in and does an investigation on the cattle and says it's a probable <coughs> kill or it's a confirmed kill, the market value of cattle that day is paid to that livestock producer. I don't to think about it. 50 cattle. So you have your chino pockets granules says, oh my gosh, you're gonna get this. They're killing all our cattle. I live in Stevensville, Montana, literally 40 miles from my house is a place called Darby. We lost 40 cattle in one night. Now they died, lightning strike, and the cattle were under the tree. <laughs> I never hear about that. Oh, it's, oh my gosh, you kill all these cattle. And it's, it's just not true. The, the people who investigate the kills, from what I've read, there's a difference. If it's a dog pack, it's going to look different. If sure. it's a coyote, it's going to look sure. different. Sure. How honest are they in their investigations? Okay. Carter Neomar would probably be the better person to answer that question. But I'll take a swing at it. Wolves have a certain technique that they kill. Usually they hamstring them and they, they bring them down. But, the, okay. We have encouraged, there's a guy named John Steiber. John runs Wildlife Service for a program for Montana. We have encouraged John, and we even offered to pay John for the cameras so they could take pictures of these animals that were killed. They refuse to do it. Why do you think that is? Okay, here's what happens. They lose an animal. They call Wildlife Service. Wildlife Service comes in and Wildlife Service Services and Livestock are very close. The livestock producer applies pressure wildlife services by just being there, his presence, and a relationship they have <clears throat> where they can't say no. It's just, I mean, think about it. Your wife asks you to do something, you want to say no to her, you have a good relationship with your wife. And when your friends ask you to do something, you do it. It's the same with all wildlife services. We were hoping to get cameras out to all the agents so they could take pictures and then we could, you know, look at these pictures and research them and figure out where they confirm kills and where they're they not. And Wildlife Service refused to uh, take us up on our offer. So, but keep in mind now, Wildlife Service is evolving. They're starting to implement uh, non-lethal measures. Now, is it something they want to do? Probably not. But it's because of people like you who care. That give people like us Power to go in and ask for things and start demanding things. Change is happening, but it's just not as fast as it's like. Um, keep in mind litigation. Litigation is always a factor. I, mean, it, I tell the people that yell at me, um, you know, they say, you know, you know, first of all, I want to tell you something. We don't make $100 million a year litigating. You always hear that argument. Oh my gosh, you know, you're suing because you're making all this money. First Justice does a great, great job. Wild Earth Guardians litigators do a great job. They don't make this unbelievable amount of money litigating. Litigating, litigation is a last resort of you, not you per se, but these individuals not following the law. That's why people litigate. The law is the law, you need to follow the law. You follow a lot, there'll be no litigation. That's how I say it. So always be careful of litigation because there's going to be blowback. And it's not going to be you and I that suffer. It's going to be the wildlife. But at a certain point, you have to do it. Um, 
the genotypic granulosis, they're killing all my cattle, they paint a picture of doom and gloom. They're, they're gonna come and get your kids. You know, you hear the story of the kids going to school and they're sitting there. You know how many people have been killed by wolves? Since, yeah, it's maybe two. It just, it's, you know, your odds of dying from a bee sting are greater. So what are we gonna do, all the, all the bees? It's just, it makes no sense. Um, the scare tactics, that, that all ties into it. Um, then eventually it gets a physically threatening behavior towards cold people. Do you, does anybody know in here what people hate of the anti-wolf community? What people hate more than wolves? They hate you because you're pro-wolf. You're trying to do the right thing. Ten years ago, if you went to a meeting, you would walk into a meeting, maybe as many people as are here now, maybe some more, um, and they would all hate you. And they would hate you, and they, and they would mean love you. They'd look at you and try to intimidate you to be quiet. And I've taken pictures, I, I photographed those guys, and I've taken pictures of grizzly bears where they're like 40 feet away, maybe 60 feet away. And I'm more afraid walking into a room of people that are anti-wolf than taking a picture of a grizzly bear. I hope you kill me, you know, whenever you want to kill me. But that's changing. You never saw ladies at these meetings. It's changing, folks. I go to meetings now, and it's not unusual to 60% or more people at these meetings are pro-wolf. And a majority of them are ladies. So what I'm seeing is you have in Montana five people on the commission of fish, wildlife, and parks. They're the ones that make the laws on what's going to happen for the next hunting season. We need to give them a platform to stand on. And by you going there, you writing these people, you calling these people, you developing respectful relationships with these people, you're giving them that platform to bring about the change you want. If we're not there to give them that platform, they're going to be seen as too green. You're, you're anti-hunting, you're anti-livestock, and that's not it. You will also hear that a lot of commissioners at least in Montana, oh, they're on the take, um, they're corrupt. Let me tell you something. I don't agree with all their decisions, especially when it comes to wolves. But they're good, decent people. They're just, they've decided to get into a position that's very controversial. But if you give them that platform to stand on, they will speak up for you. So, the physical behavior, that's kind of dying out. There's still a couple, uh, Toby Bridges, uh, Lobo Watch, he's, Toby's an interesting individual. He runs a program called Lobo Watch. You can go online and check it out. Uh, he's big time hater of wolves. But here's, here's Toby's game. Toby isn't a non-problem. So a lot of people look to Toby as an individual that is representing the rights of Americans and representing the rights of hunters. But here's what they're not seeing. Toby's always asking for money. So every time he goes out there and says something stupid, people are sending him money. So he's, he's taking this situation all the way to the bank. So he shakes the trees, gets everybody riled up, sending money out of the bank. I think I'd seen Toby at one meeting, two meetings, and I've been to hundreds of meetings. So he has this community that he's catering to. And he's not the only one. There's a guy named Scott Rockholm who does this out of Idaho. Uh, he's shaking the trees, getting all this money given to him, but there's no accountability. You know, I, I can, at least with Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, I know where they stand and financially they're legit. But some of these people are just, you know, provocateurs trying to bring about, uh, you know, chaos and hate all the way to the bank. So there's, a, sadly, an entrepreneurial spirit in the wolf world that wants to uh, really not bring about change. They don't want to resolve this issue because it's financially to them, it's benefits. It benefits them. Okay, this is Jim Stone's property. 
with the plaid tree on the right. If you look off into the distance, that's the Bob Marshall. Folks, if you ever get a chance to go there, I encourage you. And I also encourage you to go to Yellowstone. If you really want to see wolves, it's a, a fantastic place. I go there to recharge my soul. You know, I, you go to these meetings and eventually if you do anything long enough, it kind of, it really beats the heck out of you. So whenever I go to Yellowstone, I, I recharge my soul because I'm surrounded by good people who like wolves and, you know, they just love wildlife to begin with. Um, does anybody know what this picture in the bottom left is? Elk. Exactly, they're elk. Okay. In 1995, when they, keep this number in mind, in 1995, when they reintroduced wolves, do you know how many elk there were in Montana? I don't expect you to do this. <laughs> but there were 95,000. 95,000. Right now we have approximately six to 700 wolves in Montana, and it's how many, 20 years later or so. Okay, do you know how many wolves are, um, how many elk there are in Montana? None. They ate them all. See if you pay attention. But my, my point is this. Okay. At the last commissioner's hearing, one of the commissioners who was a livestock guy, he's a good guy, he's, uh, he brought it up. There's 162,000 elk. So what I'm telling you is when the hunting community tells me that they're eating all those darn elk, uh, that's, not, that's not how it is, folks. Now, there's more elk now than there ever was. Here's the problem. And there's a little bit of sarcasm in this. You gotta get out of your truck to hunt now. Okay? Where before, you know, that the elk weren't vigilant. They would, you know, my grandfather hunted here, my great grandfather hunted here, <laughs> and the elk have always been there. Now they're not here. Well, you know why they're not here? It's not because they've been eaten because they've been vigilant and they realize, you know what, if I stay here for long, I'm gonna get eaten. <coughs> so what we have is we have a culture of lazy hunters who now they gotta get out of their car and they gotta go, they really gotta apply those skills of hunting. And they don't like it one bit. Um, that is changing too. I have friends that are serious hunters. They're, young, they're younger guys. I'm 57, I don't want to say Chris is probably 28. And he doesn't want to go shoot a cow with horns yeah. in a field. He wants to go out and hunt. It's him using his skill and chasing these animals and figuring out, outsmarting them and killing them. And you know what, to get away, he laughs. He figures out, what the heck did I do wrong? That's the way it's supposed to be. It's not, you know, Roll down your window, roll and shoot your animal. So what I'm telling you is, don't buy that alarm. You know, oh my gosh, they're, they're killing all the elk. They're not. There's 160,000 in Montana now. And what was the 95? 95 was when the wolves were reintroduced in 1995. And elk then? There was 95,000. And now 100,000? 162, I think. So the numbers are going up. I'm going to tell you a story about a little town called Darby. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> Darby has two areas to hunt. You have 250, hunting district 250, and you have hunting district 270. They both had a collapse in the elk herds. They weren't going to be able to sustain themselves. They have what they call calf recruitment. Those are the babies that are born every year. And if you have below, I want to say to recruitment, if you have below probably 15%, the herd is destined to doom. So here's what happened, or at least this, is, this would be the Darbarian point of view on this. The wolves came in, they were, were these once mighty herds were, they killed them, and they're killing all the calves. So Fish, Wildlife, and Parks steps up to the plate and says, hey, you know what, we need to do a study. So in this study, they need money. So who do you think finances or helps finance the majority of the study? Rocky Mountain Elk, Safari Club International. Those are big money behind it. Okay, now I'm gonna fast forward three years. The study's done. You wanna know what the study ended with? There were forage issues because 
Um, the food wasn't good when the babies would be born, they'd be weak. Lions were killing them. And I'm not anti-lion. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to throw lions under the bus, or bears under the bus, to save wolves. I'm looking for a balanced system here. So lions were killing them, and black bears were killing the most. You could actually see them zigzagging through a sage, sage belt, or sagebrush, trying to flush the babies up. Black bears were killing the most. So what was hoped was the Safari Club International Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation would be able to say, hey, listen, we told you. Well, now they can't say that. So backtrack a little bit and follow me on this. There's a lady named Debbie Barrett out of Dillon. She was a senator. And when she was in the House of Representatives, she's no longer there, she turned out. When she was in the House of Representatives, she passed a bill called HB 42. HB 42 mandated Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to look at the entire state and figure out how many elk they can have. And the number came up to about 95,000, 92, 95,000. Anything over that number was considered surplus. So now, to Darby in 250 and 260 that already has forage problems. The wolves are coming into the picture. Okay, now you have high <coughs> rates of hunting, and you're having successful hunts because there's so many out there. So the people in Darby and hunters around that area are saying this is this is awesome. But what they're doing is they're killing the cows, and the cows are responsible for for calves. They knocked the number down so low that people just couldn't believe it. And they stepped back. People have a habit of, of blaming somebody else. It wasn't, I've, I've been, you know, I've always had good hunting in this area. Why would it change now? But in fact, what's happened is you have the forage issue, you have climate change, you have fractured habitat, you have people going in there on uh, quads and things like that, disrupting the past. And you have Debbie Barrett's House Bill 42 that hammered the elk in these areas. That was the final determination of the study. And I can tell you what, Rocky Mountain Elk and Safari Club International were that as hell because that's not what they wanted to hear. It's not the wolves, it's not the predator wolves, it's us. One thing I've always learned, 57, when I was a 40-year-old kid, well, maybe not a 40-year-old kid, but when I was 20, I used to speak my mind. But the wolf community and decision makers is such a small community. Don't always say what you think, because it will come back to haunt you. So I encourage you, please, think what you want. Don't always say what you think. Here's how we can bring about change. Don't get mad. That doesn't do anything. Get affected. I don't care how you folks decide to move forward. Just move forward. You can hope for change, but you know what? I'm telling you what, you're probably not going to be happy with the outcome. Contact decision makers. Make relationships with them. Sit down with them. Find them. You'd be surprised what you can get for a donut and coffee. It's, you get fun, you get time where you can sit down and you have their ear. Take that time. You can be a super advocate. I know some organizations will set aside people who are really, really determined to have their voice heard and to protect wolves. Get involved that way. Organize locally. It's a great one. Please try and do that. Fund an organization that shares your beliefs. That I encourage you, big time. I think you're seeing better change at the grassroots level than you are at the higher levels like DC. I think people develop relationships. I have great relationships with many, many people who make decisions. And they're all based on respect and don't say everything you think. 
build those relationships, add to them. Okay, I'm just gonna give you a quick story of one of our successes. If you see this area right here, okay, that's Yellowstone Park right here. That's 316 and 313. We gave them a platform. We gave the commissioners a platform to work with. We gave them a plan, we did all their homework. We shut those areas down. But because of a technicality, it was taken to court, litigated by Big Game Forever, Safari Club, Rocky Mountain Elk. It was overturned. But now we have the quotas in those areas, the two goals to the start. But we're hoping with help, we'll get that down to zero goals. Okay, debunking the myth. Killing wolves increases social tolerance, not true. Wolves kill for fun, not true. Wolves spring on children and adults, not true. Wolves tape them will kill you, not true. Wolves will kill ungulates in, in, in every territory, not true. The bottom one, not the side one. Right. Okay, just very quickly, my time's up. Very quickly, here's what's going on. Rocky Mountain Elk gave $25,000 an organization in Idaho called Foundation for Wildlife Management. Rocky Mountain Elk has deep pockets. They wash their hands. They give this $25,000 to an organization in Idaho. They're the surrogates. What they do is they monitor that money and they pay people to go out there and kill wolves. So Rocky Mountain Elk can be clean, but they're not clean. They got somebody doing the dirty work. And we're, we're fighting that right now. Okay? It took me two years to get this study. This study shows that wolves in Montana, the people in Montana, the residents in Montana, want wolves. The social tolerance for wolves is increasing. But this study was funded by Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. They didn't want the information out. It took us two years to get this. One of my favorite guys. You have enemies, so what? Who else cares? Give a voice to the wolves. That's where it's at. Help wolves and help other wildlife. They belong to us all. Okay, now that I've thoroughly depressed you, <laughs> I'm going to leave you with something good. There's a chorus we sing here in this place, Colorado. It rings from the maroon bells to mile high from the great sand dunes to the highest town in America. In the birthplace of rodeo and the cheeseburger, where snow melt flows into every glass, we hear it floating on the breeze above red rocks or drifting way out into the back country where the wild things roam. And the air hums with life. It's our anthem to freedom. But listen carefully. One voice has gone missing. A note that rang through our mountains for eons has disappeared. Help us return this voice to Colorado. So, Wolves of the Rockies has partnered with the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project. Our goal is to educate the people of Colorado. And as this young lady said earlier, we are going to get wolves back into Colorado and make that area a corridor for not only the wolves in Arizona, but also in Montana. That's our goal. So I'm very grateful for everybody coming. Thank you for your time. <laughs>